And it is now time for oral questions. I recognize the member for Timiskaming Coffee. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Ontarians have praised the hard work of nurses on the front lines of our health care system. They've been some of the heroes of the pandemic, but they are overworked and burned out all across the province, including the north and rural areas. We are in a nursing shortage. It's simple, Speaker, that we need more nurses to help Ontarians. Why has the government failed to recruit and retain nurses in Ontario? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for the question. We uh, recognize and value greatly the work that nurses have done since the beginning of this pandemic and have continued to do for the past 18 months, but we do realize that they are, uh, many of them are exhausted, they need a break, that that is why we have invested over $52 million already to recruit, retain and support over 3,700 more frontline health care workers through our COVID-19 fall preparedness plan. We do have further plans to recruit and retain more workers because we know, especially with the increase in care hours in long-term care, that we will need more support. We will need more workers in our health care system. That's in home and community care, in long-term care, as well as in our hospitals. So we're continuing to build on that, and we are going to graduate more nurses because we know that we need Response. more registered nurses, RPNs, personal support workers, and everyone on the front line. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. The Ontario Nurses Association says some nurses are so burnt out they are, quit they are quitting, creating even more gaps. The Premier's science table said yesterday there is already significant fatigue and burnout among hospital health care workers. They will be further strained and at risk for burnout if their unvaccinated colleagues are unable to work due to COVID-19 infection. When will this government mandate vaccines for health care workers and ensure that the risk of disruptions drops instead of getting worse. To reply, the Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You, you know, I, I find it ironic. The uh, NDP are saying one, one thing, fire 20,000 nurses, but we need more. But I'll tell you what we're doing, Mr. Speaker. We're investing over $1 billion to make sure the temporary wage enhancement takes place. And we're investing $4.9 billion over four years to create more than 27,000 new positions for nurses and PSWs. This includes the most recent announcement of $270 million to hire 4,050 new long-term care staff across the province, partnering with the publicly funded colleges with investment. By the way, the colleges are doing an incredible job in, in training the nurses and the PSWs. Uh, we're investing $121 million to accelerate the training of nine 1,000 PSWs, investing $86 million to train up to 8,600 PSWs. We are getting some of the greatest frontline health care workers anywhere in the world, right here in the province, because of our investments. And the final supplementary. Despite the Premier's statement, the government has made it clear they do not appreciate nurses. Bill 124 strips nurses and other frontline workers of their rights to bargain their wages. They need to rip up that bill. And we need a new plan to train and return nurses with a government is willing to invest in this training and recruitment and retention. We need a government to say yes to more nurses instead of always saying no. When will this government withdraw Bill 124 and ensure that every Ontario community has the nurses that they need. Minister of Health. Thank you. Well, I've, as I've indicated before, we greatly value the work that nurses have always done, especially during the pandemic. And we are recruiting more people. We are recruiting more nurses, registered practical nurses, uh, personal support workers, and others. We're spending uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in order to be able to do that. But we also recognize that many nurses are feeling burnt out, and that's why we have uh, made mental health supports available to them, because we need to make sure that our providers are well to be able to continue to provide care. So we are providing those supports supports to nurses. We will continue to do that because we want to make sure as we finally exit this uh, roadmap that we will make sure that our frontline workers are well and safe and able to carry on their work in the future. Thank you. The next question, the member for Brampton East. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. On Monday, when the Premier should have been talking about growing our province with new Canadian immigrants, 
He instead made comments that play into racist stereotypes about new Canadians. And those comments were hurtful, divisive, and wrong. Immigrants and new Canadians struggle and work day and night to survive in Canada, working to build this province and this country. So yesterday, the Premier was given an opportunity to apologize, and he refused. So I'm going to ask the Premier again. Will he apologize for his hurtful and divisive comments towards new Canadians that are just plain wrong? The Premier. Speaker, and to the member from Brampton, I was inundated from people from Brampton, from your community, from the Sikh community, that said you were bang on and told me the story how they came here, worked their back off, and said they're just playing politics uh, with you, Mr. Speaker. I, our base, our base, my base, our family's base is made up of great, hardworking immigrants. I've been calling on the federal government for three and a half Order. years to have more immigrants. This province Order. was built on hardworking immigrants. I will support them, and I ask them to come here and work and contribute like everyone else Order. has. You know, that is the backbone of this province, our great, hardworking immigrants. So stop playing politics, and let's speak the truth. Well said. Back to the Premier. I don't think the Conservative government and the Premier understand how problematic the Premier's comments were. So let me break it down. Immigrants often come to Canada with Order. nothing. Some work in grueling jobs with low wages, struggling to get their education recognized, struggling to find housing and more. And yes, they face racism and racist stereotypes. And instead of recognizing this struggle, the Premier of Ontario made comments that feed into this division and into these racist stereotypes. A dog Order. whistle that is hurtful Order. and wrong. So I'm going to ask Order. the Conservative government and the Premier of Ontario, do the right thing, show leadership, and apologize for the Premier's reckless and hurtful and just plain wrong comments. Members, will please take their seat. Premier. Stop playing the politics. Very simple. My phone has blown up all night, all day, day before, from immigrants telling me their story, how they have come here with absolutely nothing. And they've started at low-level jobs, they've worked up, they've built companies, they've, they've started restaurants. That's the type of Ontario we need. And I find it very ironic, Mr. Speaker, I've been the one asking for 294,000 immigrants to come here and build the GDP, but guess what? Under the NDP and the Liberals, they Member never had to worry about that for 15 order. years, Mr. Speaker. They lost 300,000 jobs. They had more people than jobs since we've taken government. We have more jobs than we have people. I welcome everyone around the world, no matter where they come from, come here, start a family, start a business, Fine. and give back to the greatest jurisdiction anywhere in the world, and that's Ontario. Members, will please take your seats. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. Final supplementary. Back to the Premier. Harmony Butler is a new Canadian living in Brampton. He is an essential worker. He works throughout the pandemic. He drives truck. He works six hours. He works six days a week, 12 hours a day. And in the evenings and on the weekends, he delivers food. He easily works 16 hours a day, six days a week. He lives in a basement apartment where he provides for his wife and his daughter. His is a story of so many other new Canadians who are struggling to make a life here in Canada. Do they sound like immigrants who are here only to collect the dole? What possible excuse could the Premier of Ontario have for saying his reckless and irresponsible comments? Why would he say that immigrants are only coming to Canada to collect benefits? And why won't he apologize? Order. Order. Premier, I, I didn't say that. I, again, they're playing politics. I'm the biggest pro-immigrant premier we've ever seen here, ever. Our 
Our family's been the same way. Again, I go back to our, our base. This is how we created. That's the reason I'm down here, because the hardworking immigrants that couldn't pick up the phone and call any of the MPPs, they wouldn't return their phone calls. They could call the Premier, I'll return their phone call. They'll call the mayor of the largest city in Toronto, they returned the phone calls and went to their door. And I, I challenge my friend, uh, Mr. Singh, I will go to his community, I'll door knock, and I'll see the response from the sick community and the sick community that came down to visit me and said, you're bang on, Doug. Just keep going and stay focused. That's what we're going to do. We're going to continue to create jobs. We're going to make sure that when people come here, they have affordable housing that the NDP and the Liberals voted Response. against. We're going to have highways for people to drive on that the NDP voted against. We're going to increase health care that the NDP voted against. It's no, 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 no for these people across the aisle, and we're saying yes. Stop the call. Members, members please take this seat. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Essex. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, uh, yesterday afternoon, the Premier revealed that he'd be bumping his House leader up to uh, this brand new, never heard before uh, title as Minister of Legislative Affairs. Uh, we know that this isn't just a title bump, Speaker. It comes with a $27,000 a year pay raise. But the Premier talks a big game about looking out for workers, but he's the one, Speaker, that passed Bill 124 that targets frontline workers, our nurses, the angels in our community that have seen trauma and tragedy and continue to see it every day. And it freezes their salaries for the very people that have continued to keep us safe during this pandemic. Speaker, can the Premier explain why his House Leader, his right-hand man, deserves this generous promotion, but our hard-working Frontline workers do not. To reply, uh, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I do appreciate uh, the opportunity to answer the question, Mr. Speaker. As I uh, informed uh, uh, the uh, opposition House Leader yesterday, in fact, uh, the uh, the new responsibilities come with a mandate to ensure that uh, the Legislative Assembly, which is in uh, dire need of uh, a repair, which is in need of a decanting. Uh, uh, the function of that is returned to parlamentarians and away from uh, uh, from uh, the public service, Mr. Speaker. I think uh, all members would agree to that. As I said, I informed uh, both the Liberal House Leader yesterday and the Opposition House Leader of that, uh, Mr. Speaker. Having said that, Mr. Speaker, the member is quite correct in one thing. When it comes to investing in health care, a massive investment in his community with respect to a brand new hospital that, of course, was not a priority for them when they shared a coalition government with the Liberals, Mr. Speaker. He never advocated for that. He never advocated for health care workers. He never advocated for long-term care. He never advocated for the twinning of his highways, which we're getting done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. The member will take a seat. Supplementary question. Speaker, what's quite clear is that when it comes to taking care of his friends and his buddies, the Premier is all ready to say yes, yes, yes to a pay raise for the government House Leader, but when, it, when it's time to pay frontline workers, those nurses, it's no, 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 and he has entrenched it in law in this, in this building. Speaker, all we know so far is that the House Leader will be topped up with close to about $30,000. That's about six months' worth of hard-working nurse's salary, or an entire year of a minimum wage worker's salary, but it might not stop there. Speaker, can the Premier tell us what other perks or promotions come with this new title? Will the Minister have access to private transportation, limousine service, uh, according to uh, this new title that he now holds? And again, the government House Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Of course, Mr. Speaker, I, I understand what the member is doing. He's embarrassed by the fact that he has sat in this house since, what, 2011 and has been unable to get a brand new hospital for his region, and we were Order. able to get it in our first term of government. The member's embarrassed. Six come to order. The member for Hamilton Mountain come to order. Government House Leader has the floor. The member's embarrassed that, although he has sat there and accomplished very little for his community, that in our first term of government, we were able to twin highways in his area so that we could get people in the economy in his area moving better and people around, Mr. Speaker. The member is probably embarrassed by the fact that whilst he was in a coalition with the Liberals, 
The only thing he asked for was a stretch goal on auto insurance, not new long-term care beds, not hospitals, not transit, not transportation. He sat there and approved the closing of schools, rural schools, uh, Mr. Speaker, to the tune of some 600. On every measure, he has not delivered Member for his for community, Essex, come and that's why on June 2nd of 2022, a new Conservative member of provincial parliament. Stop the clock. The government house leader and the member for Essex will come to order. Uh, perhaps you didn't hear. The government house leader and the member for Essex will come to order, and we'll move to warnings if need be. For Hamilton Mountain, we'll come to order. <laughs> Member for Ottawa South will come to order. Here's <laughs> <laughs> your facial expression. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Etobicoke Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I just we want to talk. To, we want to turn this back to things that are really important to Ontario, which is about the pandemic. The pandemic has caused a lot of economic distress for people in various ways, and during these unprecedented times, we, it's meant that some women have faced the reality that many others well know about the worry about affording necessary period products she needs each month. It's not a subject that we often talk about. Some of us never talk about it, but that's because many of us just take it for granted that more women and girls are having increased difficulty affording the appropriate men menstrual hygiene products, including while in school. The inability to afford these necessary products is often referred to as period poverty. We see this especially with young women and girls who may miss out on a day of school and other activities because of challenges to access the necessary menstrual products. Can the Minister of Women and Children's Issues tell us how this government is planning to address period poverty in Ontario? For children and women's issues. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Etobicoke Lakeshore for the question. As the Associate Minister of Children and Women's Issues, I am always trying to ensure that women and girls have the support they need to succeed and reach their full potential. I was surprised to learn, according to a survey by Plan International Canada, 63 per cent of women and girls have regularly and occasionally missed an activity because of their period and concerns of not having access to menstrual hygiene products. And one in seven young people aged 13 to 21 speakers struggled to afford period products. Mr. Speaker, because of our government's continued efforts to end period poverty, we have partnered with Shoppers Drug Mart to provide these essential menstrual products for free to students across Ontario. Our government is committed to ending period poverty, and this partnership is the first step towards progress. Thanks so much. Thank the supplementary question. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the minister for that answer. You know, the, I, once again, this is something we don't normally talk about, but I'm really glad to he see that our government is working with the private sector hand in hand to provide these free products to our schools. Mr. Speaker, I know that 12 months ago, Minister Lecce embarked on the negotiations to help end period poverty. And it is clear now, more than ever, that young women and girls need access to these products. I think it's critical that we come together, women and men, to support all students, especially those who are facing hardship, poverty, or menstrual health struggles. Can the Minister of Education tell this health, health, House why this negotiation it was important to him, to our government, and most importantly, how would it improve the lives of young girls and women and other students across Ontario? The Associate oh, the Minister of Education. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from Etobicoke Lakeshore for her leadership, standing up for young students and women and girls in our province. And we agree that in 2021, in this 
and this country. It is unacceptable that so many young students were unable to attend school due to a lack of access to menstrual products. We've been guided by and informed and inspired by the voices of students who called on the government to take action to help end period poverty. And that's why we worked in partnership with Shoppers Drug Mart uh, under the leadership of the Premier to help ensure that from an equity perspective, from a health perspective, and from an academic perspective, we ensure every child could be in school every day. And that's why we're proud uh, to have announced a commitment over three years for 18 million menstrual products for 1,200 dispensers supporting schools in this province so that we can improve the mental health uh, of students and, more importantly, we can ensure that all kids uh, have access to the menstrual products that they deserve. Thank you. So the next question, member for Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Speaker. Yesterday, I was part of a devastating meeting, Speaker. It was a meeting that the Minister of Culture, Tourism and Sport should have had with the restaurant industry. The industry represents 450,000 workers, it generates billions of dollars in tax revenue, and it operates on a knife's edge of profitability. A healthy restaurant operates with 3 to 5 percent profit, but during the pandemic, 8 out of 10 restaurants operated at a loss or barely scraped by. Some businesses uh, or some of the sales have come back, but not enough, Speaker. Sales are down 30 percent, and seating capacity is still capped. Winters are hard in the best of years for restaurants, and this is the worst of years, Speaker. The situation is untenable. Restaurants have several asks, and I would respectfully, through you, Speaker, request that the Premier address each one. Will the Premier lobby the federal government to continue the wage subsidies throughout the winter? Will the government stop insurance companies from imposing 30 to 200 percent increases on premiums? Will they commit to no penalties on unpaid deferred payments? This industry is about family and community. I know I worked in it for years, Speaker. Will this Premier Question. support the restaurant industry and get them through the coming winter? And to apply the Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industry. I appreciate the member opposite's question. Of course, I know he has worked in the restaurant sector and hospitality sector himself, and uh, we wish him uh, great success. Um, that said, I want to be perfectly clear. The Ministry of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries, including myself as the minister, have met on multiple occasions with our restaurant working group, which we established um, in our own way. And we've met with them similarly, myself, uh, over four times. Uh, my colleague, the Attorney General, my colleague, the Treasury Board President, my other colleague, the Minister of Labour, all sat down in order to support the restaurant industry, and we look forward to their actual recommendations. I will say that our government has invested over $600 million to 18,000 restaurants to allow them to survive during this period of time, and we've been working. If the member opposite wants to talk about meetings, uh, the restaurant working group uh, did have representatives that were allowed to be part of a meeting that we were, uh, I had on Monday morning, of which uh, restaurants can did not show up, although Culinary Tourism Alliance did, in addition to, of course, Orma. Uh, and they also were well aware that I was meeting at the Ottawa Hospital to look at a new civic campus. That said, I did have the opportunity yesterday to meet with Ottawa Public Health. Thank you very much. And the supplementary. Thank you very much, Speaker. And for the record, restaurants in Toronto faced the longest lockdowns and the lowest amount of support across all of Canada. People ask me if I, I miss the kitchen and cooking, and what I tell them is I miss the people I worked with. They were my chosen family, and they were incredible. It's how it is in restaurants. The PM Premier likes to speak of his family, about all the people who show up at Ford Fest. These are those people, Premier. They are. I don't think they're going to show up anymore. One, order told, one owner told us of crushing debt he had taken on during the pandemic. He told us he is once again forced to lay off employees because patios are closing and capacity is still limited. And he talked about how throughout the pandemic he has been covering the cost of rent for employees who were losing their homes, covering their medical bills, their childcare costs, Order. buying groceries Order. for his employees. So through you, Speaker, to the Premier. And I hope that the ministers from North Bay and the minister from McKeon are listening closely to our The member will take a seat. The member for Essex is warned. I apologize to the member for Kingston the Island. Please conclude your. Thank you, Speaker. I was looking down. I, I didn't see you rise there. I apologize. So, again, through you to the Premier, 
and I do hope that the ministers from North Bay and Nepean are listening very closely. Your ridings are filled with independent, family-owned restaurants. Please find it in yourselves, have the economic wherewithal, have the compassion, whatever it takes to get there, to bring back a third round of small business funding and help these restaurants get through the winter. Thank you. Thank you. And to reply, Minister Perry. Uh, thanks. As I did mention, um, over $600 million was invested directly to 18,000 restaurants throughout the pandemic. We also provided a great deal of support through rent relief, energy relief. In addition, my ministry has just announced another $100 million fund uh, for tourism and economic development recovery. We continue to work with the Ministry of Economic Development and Trade, as well as Treasury Board and Finance, in order to support our sectors. I will say this. Uh, in order for us to get back to full capacity, in order for us to continue to get back to normal, we need to download that QR code. And I'm pleased to say that over uh, 800,000 have been verified in the last couple of weeks. But I did receive troubling information yesterday from Ottawa Public Health. As, as the member opposite knows, I'm a proud member from the City of Ottawa who indicated to me that right now 30 per cent of our restaurants are failing to comply to uh, the ability to uh, verify the uh, vaccination certification. I will continue to work with the sector, not only to provide them with funding and in order for them to stabilize, but also in order for Response. them to adhere to public, uh, public health protocols, because that is the key for us to get back to economic and social recovery and success. And before I recognize the uh, member for Ottawa South, I'll apologize to him for mistakenly calling him to order yeah, earlier this morning. For past transgression, so. <laughs> we move on. Don't worry. Member for Ottawa South. Uh, my question is for the Premier, and I hope that he's listening very closely. So Ontario's families have been through so much in the last 19 months. Lost income, lost time at school, lost time with loved ones, and so many other things. And vaccines have arrived, and they've brought hope. So it's perfectly reasonable for families to expect that the person caring for a loved one in hospital, or in their own home, or at school, or in a child care centre, that that person has been vaccinated against COVID-19. And we know that vaccines reduce transmission, disease, hospitalization, and death. And we know that seniors, those are who are immunocompromised, and children under 12 who can't be vaccinated are very vulnerable to the Delta variant. So, speaker through you, why is the Premier refusing to make vaccinations mandatory for frontline health care and education workers. Mr. Health. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. This is a very important issue, and it's one that we're analyzing on a daily basis within the hospital sector. As you know, we have one, have one of the most successful vaccination rates in the world, with over 87 per cent of uh, Ontarians age 12 and older having received their first dose, and over 84% being fully vaccinated. Since we announced our last mile strategy, we've had a big increase in vaccination rates that largely will include healthcare workers. We've had approximately 365,700 first doses and approximately 525,900 second doses. We do recommend that every Ontarian be vaccinated. We do recommend particularly healthcare workers be vaccinated because they are dealing with the public and dealing with very ill patients. And the vast majority of people already have an online health care situation. So we are reviewing this on a daily basis, and I'll have more to say on this in my supplementary. Any supplementary question? Well, thank you, Speaker. But, you know, very clearly the Minister of Long-Term Care understands breakthrough infections and infections in the unvaccinated because he made vaccines mandatory in long-term care. And when he said that, he said, although staffing might be impacted by this policy, the priority has to be protecting the safety of residents and the safety of other staff. The minister said, while they might lose some staff who are unwilling to get vaccinated, home operators are much more concerned about the implication of an outbreak and what that would mean to staffing. So the same principle applies in hospitals, in schools, in child care centres, in home care, in all other settings where that kind of care is delivered. It's really hard to understand why you're incrementally parsing this all out. It doesn't make sense. Question. It's not logical. So, Speaker, through you, will the government be supporting Bill 12 this afternoon 
and make vaccinations mandatory for frontline health care and education workers and protect the most vulnerable among us. Minister of Health. Well, first, the situation with long-term care homes and the staff in those homes, it's different than in other locations because long-term care homes have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. However, that said, the Premier has sent a letter to uh, hospitals in Ontario and other health care, frontline health care providers to understand what the impact would be for a mandatory vaccine requirement because it's not a simple standalone issue. We understand that there will be some people that will not be vaccinated, and we already have health human resource concerns. We want to make sure that our hospitals can continue to provide excellent quality care, so we have to weigh the benefits of mandatory vaccination versus the job losses that might happen for people who choose not to be vaccinated. So we have received those responses pursuant to the letter that response. the Premier sent out. We are reviewing those answers now, and we'll make a determination very shortly with respect to this issue of mandatory vaccination. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Kitchener, Conestoga. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And my question is to the Minister of Seniors and Accessibility. Uh, Mr. Speaker, over the summer, I've had the opportunity to meet with many businesses in my community of Kitchener, Conestoga, and to see firsthand what they are doing to create a more accessible Ontario. Last month, I had the uh, honour to show the minister uh, around uh, the beautiful town of Elmira uh, to see what they're doing to keep their downtown core accessible, and also had an opportunity to, uh, to tour Onward Manufacturing with him in Kitchener, where they've rolled out some fantastic programs to help people's with, uh, people with disabilities. Can the minister please share with the House uh, what the government is doing to ensure that all of Ontario is accessible so that every Ontarian can live the Ontario dream? Minister responsible for seniors and accessibility. For raising this important question. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to answer that question by sharing real example. The town of Elmira is showing leadership on what small businesses in that town are doing to make their community more accessible to everyone. These small businesses are echoing the Ontario spirit that is being shown across the province during National Disability Employment Awareness Month. I saw this firsthand at the Onward Manufacturing Facility when I toured this small business with my good friend, the member for Kitchener Conestoga. They showed us firsthand the value of employing people with a disability and how they make their workplace accessible for everyone. Onward manufacturing is a real example. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Well, thank you, Speaker. And uh, you know, it's encouraging to see the work that the ministry is doing. We got to see it firsthand while we were out touring around some of these uh, local small businesses. Uh, in addition to the investments in accessibility, the seniors community knows this government has invested billions of dollars to protect them during the COVID-19 pandemic. And as we continue to combat the fourth wave, seniors need to know that their government is there for them. Speaker, if the minister could tell us a little bit more about the work that his ministry is doing to protect seniors as the fight against COVID-19 continues. Thank you, Speaker. The Minister. Thank you to the member for Kitchener Conestega. Thank you for your continued support and excellent work for Ontarians in your riding. Our government is protecting seniors in the riding of Kitchener Conestega and the rest of Ontario by investing in the infection prevention control measures to help stop the spread of COVID-19 in retirement homes. Mr. Speaker, it's my honor to share with the House that the writing of Kitchener Conestica received over $215,000 in IPEC funding. That's over $215,000 more dollars to spend on step PPE training Response. and other measures to stop the spread of the virus. Thank you. 
Thank you. The next question, the member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier and Hope of Lansford for the people of Niagara. Today in Niagara, only 6% of the residents have received their MRI within the provincial benchmark of 28 days, compared to 46% of other Ontario residents who had their scan in that time. The current wait time for an MRI in Niagara, listen to this, is 255 days, well above the provincial average of 141. In Niagara, thanks to the help of Mr. Tom Rankin, we have fundraised enough money to install an MRI unit. We have requested from this government $1.52 million to run the new MRI machine seven days a week to clear up the backlog. Will you provide the funding in that request and assure the residents of Niagara have fair access to MRI scans, yes or no? Minister of Health. Well, certainly our goal is to make sure that everyone in Ontario, including in Niagara Region, can have uh, fair access, timely access to uh, both surgeries and diagnostic procedures that have been delayed as a result of COVID-19. So that's why, as part of our $1.8 billion investment into the hospital sector, we're also dedicating $300 million to reduce surgical backlogs and to increase diagnostic procedures from delayed or cancelled surgeries and procedures because of the pandemic. And this is in addition to the $200 million that we introduced last fall because we know that people have been waiting long periods of time. We want to make sure that we can get caught up, which we are doing very quickly, uh, on both surgeries and diagnostic procedures. So that applies to everyone across the entire province. We are mindful of that and we are working very hard to make sure that we can limit the times that people have to wait to receive these procedures and surgeries. And the supplementary question. Pre Premier, Minister, you're aware of the request from Niagara Health. You're also aware of the fact that we need operating funds in Niagara. There are 5,000 residents today waiting for an MRI. 5,000. These scans could be the difference of life or death, and people are sitting home stressed out, waiting for 255 days to get a scan they need. It's disgraceful in this province. We did our part. We fundraised enough money to buy the machine. That's our obligation. Now the Premier has to do his part and provide the funding to clear the backlog and get these people the access to medical services they need. In 2017, the Conservatives supported my motion to end these backlogs by fund funding the MRI scan in Niagara. The people of Niagara need them now to live up to that commitment. Will the Premier say today to the residents of Niagara that he will be delivering the money needed to clear the backlog and ensure that no resident in Niagara, no resident in Niagara has to wait 255 days for a scan that they medically need? Thank you. No. Well, I can't speak specifically to the issue that the member is mentioning. I can indicate that we are working very hard to catch up on the surgeries and uh, diagnostic procedures that had to be cancelled or delayed because of COVID-19. But I'm also pleased to say that in 2020-2021, the average Ontario hospital completed 88% of their targeted surgical and diagnostic allocation. This is something we are working very hard on. We've invested over $500 million in order to be able to do that. We know that people have been waiting a long time. We are grateful for the fundraising efforts that have already happened, but we are doing our part to catch up and to make sure that people do not have to wait undue periods of time to have these uh, procedures done or surgeries done. So that applies across the province, including in Niagara. Thank you. The next question is the member for Chatham Kent Leamington. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Long Term Care. Sunnycrest Nursing Home, located in Whitby, recently had four deaths and seven hospitalizations within the first week since the COVID boosters were administered. Sadly, these deaths were covered up and not reported to the mainstream media for reasons that are suspect. An inquest was not called. Autopsies seeking the cause of death were not performed. Coroner findings not released. If I were a family member, I would demand answers and I wouldn't accept well, they died from other comorbidities. So, Minister, to you. 
What is the government doing to protect our elderly from dying when the purpose of the boosters are supposed to save lives? To reply, Minister of Long-Term Care. Mr. Speaker, and I, I do thank the member for the question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, our focus has been on protecting the residents of our seniors' homes, and, and of course, every every death is a tragedy, and uh, and we mourn we mourn them with the families. Um, but, Mr. Speaker, that is why uh, the province of Ontario, uh, with the support of the chief medical officer, moved as the first jurisdiction in North America to have. Uh, third doses, and I am pleased to report to the legislature today that 88 per cent of eligible residents have those boosters. Now, Mr. Speaker, and to the member, as we know, uh, there is no perfect protection against this disease, uh, and uh, that is why we continue to make sure that other protections are in place, including now uh, requiring randomized testing of both uh, immunized and non-immunized staff. Uh, we want to take every step we can to make sure that we're protecting people in our long-term care homes. Mr. Speaker, as you know, uh, on October Spons? 1st, I indicated that a vaccine mandate would be in place so that by November 15th, all staff will need to be vaccinated. Mr. Speaker, we'll take the steps we need to take to protect our elders. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and again, thank you for that response, Minister. You know, initially, these experimental drugs, aka vaccines, were coined as the saving grace to eliminate COVID. Now people must get up to six booster shots. Is that because the experimental drugs aren't as great as expected? Where's the clinical data and the research proving boosters are safe and effective? I'd like to suggest that our seniors are not human guinea pigs, yet surprisingly, there have been no animal testing on these drugs. It appears that corners have been cut in order to rush to get the vaccines and boosters out. But just to be clear, Minister, I'm not pointing fingers at you regarding the determination of the safety and the efficacy. But now it's been reported that a lawyer at Sunnycrest has threatened staff with dismissals and lawsuits should they talk to anyone about the deaths following the administering of the first round of boosters. That sounds like a cover-up. So, Minister, will you commit to investigating these allegations of threats and the hiding of any wrongdoings at Sunnycrest and to seek justice for the families affected? I, I need to caution the member on his language. The, uh, Minister of Long-Term Care to reply. Mr. Speaker, uh, again, each and every death uh, inside or outside our long-term care homes uh, is a tragedy, Mr. Speaker. But uh, from my perspective, and I appreciate the members not uh, pointing to me as a medical expert, nor should he, uh, nor would he. But but from the perspective, my perspective, the perspective of our government, the perspective of the science table, the perspective of our medical professionals, uh, the the. Potential for serious illnesses and disease is reduced by 11 times, Mr. Speaker, for those taking the vaccine. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we encourage and continue to encourage everyone to get vaccinated. Uh, we will, uh, under the leadership of the Minister of Health, continue to look at the science with regards to further booster shots and where those are necessary. But, Mr. Speaker, I think the vast majority in this legislature and the vast majority in our province understand that vaccines are an important part of the solution to ending COVID-19's challenges on our economy and our health, and we'll continue, Mr. Speaker, to follow Response. Here, here. Thank you. The next question, the member for Haldeman Norfolk. Speaker, uh, to the Minister of Finance, and I've met with many constituents in my riding, and I've heard over and over again how critical the measures we took to protect people's health and the economy were in their communities. As the rollout of our last mile vaccine plan continues, and there is light at the end of the tumble, the people of Ontario want to ensure that we do not lose any of the hard-fought gains we've made against this pandemic. But they're also looking for tomorrow. They would like to know how this government plans to deliver prosperity to Ontario workers, their families, and for the future. Speaker, would the Minister of Finance please share how he's planning to ensure we remain steadfast in our resolve against the pandemic while creating the right conditions for future economic growth? Great question. Parliamentary Assistant to Minister of Finance, member for Aurora, Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I want to thank the great member for Haldeman Norfolk, not, not just for the great leadership that he provides here in the legislature, but certainly for uh, what he does for his constituents every single day. Speaker, just like my colleague said, I've seen just how important these supports have been to many, many Ontarians, Mr. Speaker. Since the beginning of the pandemic, our government has been steadfast in commitment to make every necessary resources available to protect the people and to protect the jobs, Mr. Speaker. We've invested $19.1 billion alone in response to COVID-19. And while we've made important progress, Speaker, our job is not done. 
We cannot let our guard down against COVID-19, and our government will continue to make sure that we are there for our frontline heroes, Mr. Speaker. But as uh, we all know, we inherited a province from the previous government where real investment in infrastructure never materialized, Thoughts? Mr. Speaker, while Liberal insiders all got rich. The previous government, Mr. Speaker, said no. We're going to say yes, Speaker. Yes to investing in our health care capacity and seven hundred Thank you. Million dollars thank you very much. And the supplementary question. Yeah, thank you, uh, Speaker, and uh, thank you to the parliamentary assistant for that response. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's really great to hear that uh, our government is laying the foundations not only for Ontario's recovery, but also for long-term prosperity. And as the parliamentary assistant made mention, after so many years of neglect by the previous Liberal government. Now, as we all know, it's the workers on the ground. They're the front line in this fight against COVID-19 and with respect to our economic recovery. Speaker, my question, will the minister, the parliamentary assistant, provide a bit more detail on how our government's plan will support Ontario workers. <clears throat> Thanks again uh, for the great question. Speaker, my uh, colleague couldn't be more right, and that's why our government's going to fight for all workers and their families in our 2021 economic outlook and fiscal review. Mr. Speaker, our focus is both on essential workers who work tirelessly on the front lines of this pandemic and our hardworking Ontarians who have been who have set who who have set back in their new work and careers by COVID-19, Mr. Speaker, will fight for those looking for new opportunities for themselves and their families here in Ontario, Mr. Speaker, the economic engine of Canada. Speaker, our government will build on the range of training and employment supports we have already put in place to give workers the skills they need to fill our labour shortage and support our economic recovery. Speaker, our priority since the beginning of the pandemic has been protecting the people and protecting the jobs, and we're going to continue to Response. do just that. A lack of resources will never stand in our way, Mr. Speaker. We will continue fighting for people of Ontario and the jobs every single day, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Kiwetanon. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. For those of us uh, that live in the north, uh, we often pay double for the same for the same products found down here. Uh, the, the, this gap is uh, even wider when you go into flying First Nations. Get this, uh, Mr. Speaker. A regular box of tampons can range from $16 to $45, leaving people to choose between menstrual products or food security. Norma Kijic uh, of uh, Northern Shinab Education Council, they run uh, three high schools, was disappointed to see jurisdictional issues once again creating division between the provincial and First Nations schools and students. These products being offered for free to all school boards in Ontario, but not available to First Nation school boards. Why is this government discriminating? against First Nation schools. And to apply on behalf of the government, Minister of Education. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We're proud to have unveiled a plan to help end period poverty in this province for all, uh, for all publicly funded schools in the province of Ontario. This is a very positive step forward that should be celebrated as we end a challenge that has kept many young students from going to school every day. Uh, this government was resolved to fix it, whereas the former government and the New Democrats did nothing for 15 years. We took action. I mean, that just is the case. Nothing was done, and many students were staying home as a consequence. We've negotiated an agreement with Shoppers Drug Mart to set aside 18 million pads for students for over the next three years. This is a positive step forward. When it comes to Indigenous education, I'm proud, Speaker, to confirm that funding for Indigenous education within our provincially uh, uh, within our provincial schools is up to the highest levels ever recorded in Ontario history. We have strengthened the curriculum, Response. particularly from grades one to three in the social studies curriculum, to enhance Indigenous education. We'll continue to be there to support First Nation, Inuit, and Métis students in this province. And a supplementary question. Uh, got, uh, young people attending First Nation schools have high needs for these products, but, uh, but they're being excluded. 
The press release announcing this program says, this supply of free menstrual products will be provided to all school boards, but uh, it's not, that's not the case. It is unfortunate that the public-private sector agreement did not see the need to address the issue for all students in Ontario, but only for those who attend provincial schools. I'm a, I am asking, Speaker, for a clarification. As First Nations, schools in the riding have reached out and they, they asked if they can participate. Is the minister saying, is the minister telling me the program is not for First Nations schools? Thank you, Speaker. Uh, I appreciate the question from the member opposite. Uh, I believe that for many years in this province, uh, many young students were staying home as a consequence of not having access, equitable access to menstrual products. There was inaction by governments to date, and it was our government who made a decision to help uh, end period poverty in this province uh, on the advice of many student leaders, including the Ontario Student Trustees Association, who counseled us to find a fix to this problem. So we, over the last year, negotiated with Shoppers Drug Mart to deliver 18 million pads over three years, 1,200 dispensaries to, first, uh, to, uh, public, to publicly funded schools in the province of Ontario to support all students, including first Indigenous students within those schools um, and other young children in the province of Ontario. We want all kids to succeed. We want them to go to school each and every day. This investment uh, partnering with the private sector will help support better quality and equitable education for Ontario students. The next question. The member for Orléans. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, about a year ago, uh, the government issued a news release heralding the use of rapid COVID-19 tests. In, in this news release, the Premier said the new rapid tests are game changers in the fight against COVID-19. Game changers, Mr. Speaker. Despite being a game changer, the Premier ignored all the public health warnings and sent our children back to school without making investments to keep them safe and without there being a rapid testing program put in place. In fact, at the end of September, the Premier said no to rapid testing and ordered that agencies stop supplying rapid tests to parents. So we have parents seeing the Premier sitting on the sidelines and in an effort to keep themselves safe, step up to do the work that the Premier has said no to. So Mr. Speaker, the Premier has said that rapid tests are a game changer. When is he going to get into the game? Of education. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We are proud in this province to have one of the highest vaccine rates for young people in this province in Canada, as well as one of the lowest case rates uh, for young people in the country. And that's because we followed the best advice of the Chief Medical Officer of Health, consulted with CHEO in the members' region of Ottawa and sick kids in Toronto. And the guiding light of those of that advice has been to involve and to uh, bring forth a layered approach to our school safety. Mr. Speaker, we're proud that 99.9% .9 of our schools are open, 2 million children are learning, supported by safe schools with significant improvements in ventilation in every single school. We have expanded testing options, the take-home PCR testing option for high school asymptomatic students, and yes to the member's question, we have added in an additional tool with the, uh, the deployment of rapid antigen screening where public health units in the province can deploy wherever they see fit based on risk. Not political decisions, but that of the medical officers of health. We have trust in our medical leaders. We have confidence in the frontline staff in our schools, and we are grateful for the partnership keeping schools safe in this province. Supplementary question. Supplemental is also for the Premier. Uh, throughout the pandemic, the government has taken a reactive approach. They are routinely a day late and a dollar short, or rather, Mr. Speaker, often weeks late and billions of dollars short in keeping Ontarians safe. At the end of September, school-aged children accounted for the highest share of COVID-19 cases of any demographic in Toronto. The Premier has said no to reducing class sizes. The Premier has said no to ensuring vet vaccinated educational staff. The Premier has said no to rapid testing surveillance. Now, there are serious questions as to whether the government is doing all it can to keep our classrooms and schools as safe as possible. In fact, Mr. Speaker, this week, the Premier said it wasn't safe for him to take personalized executive tutoring in French one-on-one, -on -one, Mr. Speaker. But he's asking our kids to sit in packed classrooms 
without rapid testing surveillance, and without knowing their Question. teacher or the child beside them is vaccinated. So, Mr. Speaker, does the Premier believe that the classroom environment he's asking teachers and students to endure is safe when receiving one-on-one -on -one executive tutoring in a controlled environment is not? <laughs> Thank you, Speaker. I think the fundamental question for members opposite is, do we agree with the advice of the Children's Health Coalition, uh, who provided public statement just days ago? And they said, and I quote, data from Public Health Ontario suggests that the overall efforts to limit virus transmission, such as masking, distancing, and, and vaccination, have been successful, with less than 0.25 per cent of Ontario's 2 million student population testing positive. The coalition also noted that among the total number of cases in children and youth between September 19th and October 2nd, 79.5% were not linked to school outbreaks. We have, in this province, one school closed of nearly 5,000. We have 2 million children learning. We have an overwhelming consensus that the ventilation improvements, the masking indoors, the enhancement of testing and screening and better cleaning is making these places safe for kids, safe for staff. But we take nothing for granted. We're Response. With the Deputy Premier, we've added another layer by the deployment of the rapid antigen screening program that was deployed at the school in Toronto that has now reopened following the deployment of PCR take-home tests as well. We're doing everything we can, working with public health to keep schools safe. Next question, the member for Sudbury. Speaker, uh, speaker uh, questions to the Premier. Speaker, as of the end of July, there's a backlog of more than 700,000 driving tests. Since August, the Minister of Transportation has announced additional temporary road test centres in nine locations. The locations, Speaker, are Guelph, Oshawa, Burlington, Markham, East Gwillimbury, Mississauga, Southwestern Ontario, Niagara Region, and the Ottawa area. You may have noticed that zero of those nine locations are located in Northern Ontario. The backlog of driving tests is a huge issue in Northern Ontario, Speaker. Leaving out Northerners from taking their driving tests means they can't go to work. That means lost wages, lost appointments, lost opportunities. The Premier needs to take action now, Speaker, to allow Northerners to get on the road and get on with their lives. Will the Premier commit to opening additional temporary road test centres across Northern Ontario, including one in my riding of Sudbury? The Associate Minister of Transportation. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker, and I appreciate the member for, uh, asking that question because it's important to address the backlog of drive tests. Obviously, this pandemic has affected everyone, and that includes those trying to get those drive tests done. And that's why in June, our ministry introduced a plan, a committed investment of more than $16 million to tackle that very backlog the member is referencing uh, when it comes to in-vehicle passenger road tests. And as part of this plan, we are opening more temporary road test facilities, hiring an additional 251 examiners, and offering road tests with extended hours on weekdays and, hol uh, and holidays. In fact, just recently, Speaker, we opened three additional temporary road tests uh, throughout the province, and I know there's more work to be done, but we're going to clear that backlog and make sure that people are getting those drive tests in a timely manner. Speaker, and back to the Premier. I'll talk about Rick. Rick is a constituent of mine. Uh, his daughter's been driving for five years, and like many Sudburyans, she relies on driving to get to university and to get to work. However, Rick told me she can't make an appointment for her G test, get this speaker, until December 31st of 2022. Speaker, the Conservative government brought in nine additional temporary road test centers, and all of them, all the ones he was talking about, are in southern Ontario. This disregards the need for northern Ontario's people in northern Ontario who lack the robust public transportation systems of southern neighbours. The north is where we use highways to get to work, not subways. So wait times for drive tests are especially devastating in northern Ontario. People in the north don't have the choice of a train, subway and bus to take them to work. When will the Premier open additional temporary road test centres in northern Ontario, including in my riding of Sudbury? Yes, Mr. Minister of Transportation. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And, and the member highlights a very important point. He's right. The North is very unique compared to the rest of Ontario, and they have unique challenges, and we need to address those challenges. And that's why we have been making sure that we address unique situations like Rick and help open year-round drive test centres in Northern Ontario, in Dryden, Espanola, Fort Francis, Huntsville, Capuscasing, Kenora, Kirkland Lake, New Liskard, North Bay, Sault Ste. Marie, Thunder Bay, Timmins, and Sudbury. And these drive test centres will operate year-round. And as I said, there have been additional resources allocated to make sure we address the backlog. There are more testers. We're going to get through that backlog. And when life returns to normal, we're going to be on that road to prosperity here and in the north as well. Thank you. The next question, member for Cambridge. Speaker, good morning. My question is for the Premier. 
The other day, the Premier gave us his glib, tough guy act, saying that he only wanted new Canadians that were willing to work hard rather than sit around all day. A comical choice of words coming from a Premier whose political career wasn't built on hard work, but rather on the reputation of his father and his late brother. And even funnier, considering that since getting elected, the Premier often goes missing from the public eye for long stretches, as he did for most of the summer. Perhaps the Premier was projecting and referring to his own lack of hard work when making these comments. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier admit that his crude comments about working hard were simply a diversion to distract from the fact that his government's policies have resulted in thousands of Ontarians losing their jobs over the last year and a half? Supplementary question. Supplemental, the Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The government's defence of the Premier's statements were equally, equally comical. First, the Premier said he is pro-immigrant, as evidenced by the crowds of people that would attend Ford Fest and receive calls from the late Mayor of Toronto. Well, I have news for you. People didn't go to Ford Fest to see the Premier. They went to see his late brother, Rob. And the Premier isn't the one who built a reputation on hard work and calling people back. That was also his late brother, Rob. Maybe the Premier hasn't realized yet what my family and all of Ontario now know He's not Rob Ford. Second, the Deputy Premier said the government is in favour of even more immigration, more than the 450,000 a year their friend Justin Trudeau has set, which is about double the number under the previous Harper government. Can the Premier tell us how much higher he wants immigration to increase, considering that at the same time he wants more immigrants, his government has been putting Ontarians out of work continuously on a daily basis Question. for the last three years? And to reply on behalf of the government, the government host leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I certainly won't dignify the first part of that uh, question uh, uh, with an answer in any way, shape, or form. It's uh, certainly not uh, why the people of the province of Ontario elected us here, uh, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to uh, uh, immigration, I think uh, this government has been very clear. Uh, the Premier has been uh, very clear. Uh, that we need more uh, people to come to the province of Ontario. We have a significant uh, amount of jobs that, have, uh, that need to be filled so that we can continue growth, economic growth and prosperity across the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. We can only do that if more people were to come to the province of Ontario, as they have for generations, Mr. Speaker. I mean, I am a, a, a minister in a government. Uh, I'm, uh, my parents came in the late 50s, 1960s. The Minister of Education is in the same way. We have a parliamentary assistant uh, uh, who, f uh, who fled uh, the Soviet Union. We have uh, uh, the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of, uh, of Finance, the Digital Government Minister, the Minister Spons. of Seniors, Mr. Speaker. When you look at our side of the House, we are very diverse and we're very proud of that. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. This House stands in recess until 3 p.m. <laughs>